Welcome to today's 3D print. Today we're going to go over an analysis of the Lotmax SC10 that I just got. So stay tuned. So we have the Lotmax SC10 that we just did a live stream on. Many of you guys will be thinking that printer looks familiar. Yes, it looks a lot like the Creality CR20, and I'm pretty certain that's exactly what it's based on. I don't know if it's Creality Parts or if it's a Creality clone, but um, it's got quite a few upgrades that I like. For example, it comes with a metal extruder, although I just upgraded that to the Bontech Dual Gear Extruder, which I love. Um, and it also has a touchscreen with the Robin Nano Electronics, quiet steppers for X and Y, and a very good UI. Uh, a couple improvements I would like to see to the UI. The um, selection screen, when you go to print something, we can turn it on so I can show you. Um, I'm not a fan of it. I would prefer it not to use icons. So let me give you a view here. So when you go to printing, it shows these little icons. But you can't really see a whole lot of the name. Like that's about as much of the name as you're going to get. So what I would prefer is to have four buttons here. You know, an up, return, up and down. And um, so that I can cycle through the screens, but instead of have a list of file names, you could probably fit the same five on here that you have here and still have enough space to touch, but it'll be full file names instead of these icons. So if that's possible, I'd like to see that change. Also, when you are printing and you go into the options screen, you can change things like filament change, speed, fan speed. I'd like to see flow rate added. That would be nice. Otherwise, this UI is very, very good. I like it. It's the same UI as on the Two Trees Sapphire Pro. I like it a lot. So, um, yes, this actually did come off this printer. This is the one I made on a Sapphire. And this is the one I made on this printer. So I was able to do that on this printer. For some reason, the print came out in uh, 0.1 millimeters too short. Not sure why on that yet. I still have to figure that out. I don't know if that's my slice, my model, or if um, the Z-axis needs to be calibrated. I'll figure that out later. A um, couple things that I like. Well, it's based on a CR20. CR20 is excellent. I like that machine. It has filament runout. I have not been able to get a power off or a zoom to work. It has it, but I haven't been able to make it work yet. So I'm still working on that. Parts cooling is excellent. I have zero parts cooling issues. As you can see, the bow looks fantastic. And the Marvin looks absolutely fantastic. Let me give you a close-up of that. Come on, there you go. That is one of the best Marvins I've ever printed. I mean, that's Ender 2 quality Marvin. I'm really, you see the, the consistency in the layers is fantastic. And all these prints were done on the stock extruder feeder unit that it came with, not the new Bontech one. I just determined that I like this printer enough that it was worthy of getting an upgrade. As you can see, the cooling is quite good. I want to say almost slightly better than a CR20, and I'm not sure how they did that. <laughs> but um, a couple of issues that I encountered. Um, first major issue is the the plates here. These tri-wheel plates that the printer rolls on. They're not aligned right. Something's not right. Um, I can't adjust the eccentric nuts to get these two wheels in contact with the bed. This wheel is tight, this wheel is loose, and that wheel has to be loose. I'm spinning it. Okay. If I loosen this up to try to bring these two wheels in, this arm pivots instead of this wheel coming in. What that tells me is that these two holes are not parallel to the rail. So um, let me find a better way of describing that. This is slightly exaggerated, but basically this is what you're supposed to have. This is your vertical rail. These are your three wheels. These two wheels need to be parallel. The line, if you draw a line between those bolt holes, they need to be parallel to this rail. Theirs is actually like this. So this bolt hole is slightly too far out. Or the holes that bolt the plate to this rail are not straight so either these two holes or these two holes are not parallel to their appropriate rail 
because I already checked the distance between the rails is perfect. So the, this construction is perfect. There's nothing wrong there. So either these two holes are not parallel to this rail or these two holes holding this plate to the X rail are not parallel. And it's the exact same thing over here. This wheel's tight, this wheel's tight, this wheel is loose. Not good. See, I'm turning that wheel just by plucking it. This wheel is nice and tight. Now, just so happens, you adjust these eccentrics correctly so that the forces are balanced and it works perfectly. I have zero um, Z-axis issues. I'm happy with that. Although I do have an indication of where that problem might be. I have noticed that I'm having a little bit more trouble on this side than this side. So that could be related to that. Could just be sloppy bed level. Not too concerned. One major issue I had was the Y carriage plate impacted the stepper motor, preventing the plate from activating the limit switch. Um, good news in both regards. Number one, the firmware is um, very well mannered. Your, your bed will go da -da 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 and then stop and it'll accept whatever value it is at as zero, which is good. So it doesn't sit there and go crazy. Um, what I did was I elongated these holes. Since it does not use hammer nuts, there's actually drilled threaded holes that these bolts go into. Uh, and these are also drilled and threaded, so you can't move the end stop switch and you can't move the plate. And obviously you can't move that plate. So I elongated these holes, which allowed me to push this back a little bit and it cleared fine. It was like two millimeters short. Now I did hear back from the manufacturer and their engineer that was a batch issue that has been corrected. So anybody who buys one of these now won't have that issue. You shouldn't have that issue. You can also just replace these with hammer nuts and then this becomes adjustable. One thing I would like to see is I would like to see them have a small cavity here to accept a little piece of PTFE tube because otherwise I, I always disable the sensors just because I don't like them. The sensor worked fine. I never had a problem with their sensor. And because I switched to this extruder, the hole here sits higher than the sensor hole. So I can't actually use the sensor with this feeder unit until I get longer bolts and raise this up. That is not a flaw from the manufacturer. That's because I changed the feeder unit. I like this printer enough that I deemed it worthy of an upgrade, and I gave it that unit right there. But having a small piece of PTFE tube come out here would prevent the filament from slowly sawing its way, because this will eventually cut into this plastic or metal, whatever it is. Even if it's metal, it'll cut into it eventually. So having a little bit of PC, little piece of PTFE tube come out of here will take up that um, force and if the PTFE tube wears out you just cut another one inch piece and stick it in there No big deal, but that's what I would suggest Another thing I would suggest is to replace these springs With these springs the flat die compression springs It's not even about the springs being stronger. It's about them being a, a flat profile instead of a round profile so the bed will be less likely to want to shift left and right. This one does not shift, but it can. I would also like to see, this is not an issue with the printer, but it's an upgrade I would like to see. I would like to see a notch cut out of this right here. So put a little notch in this piece right here to allow this to come down further. The limit on how far the Z-axis can come down is when this plate impacts the mount right here. You can see they, they're going to touch, okay? If you put a little notch in here to allow this to come down a little bit further, you can then lower your Z switch, your limit switch here, which will allow you to lower this bed plate a little more. And lowering that bed plate a little more, come on, focus please. There we go. Would allow you to compress these springs more. And compressing the springs more will improve the rigidity and stability of the build plate. So the looser those springs are, the less pressure there is on these wheels. And the less pressure there is on these wheels, they can vibrate and loosen themselves over time. By using die compression springs and allowing that Z-axis to come down a little bit further to allow you to compress these springs a little bit more will decrease the likelihood of all of that happening. Right now, there's a limit to how far I can compress them because there's a limit to how low I can bring the Z-axis. So I have to bring the bed up to the nozzle. I can't bring the nozzle down to the bed. Putting that notch in there would allow you to lower the head a little lower, which will allow you to bring it closer to the bed, which will allow you to compress these springs a little bit more. Again, not a flaw with the printer, just a suggestion from me on how to make the printer a little bit better. 
Um, this assembly was no problem. This is standard Creality Affair. The wheels lined up fine. It tightened up fine. Parts cooling works fine. Hot end cooling works fine. I did have a gap in my PTFE tube, so I had to reassemble the hot end in order to get rid of that gap because I was getting some heat creep. Not heat creep, I'm clogging because of the gap. But again, I have a whole video on how to take care of that. This is standard Creality Affair for the hot end. So it's pretty easy to fix, not a big deal. Also, um, Luke Hadfield has an update if you would like to use that to put on Creality printers to improve them in that regard as well. Um, I did have to adjust the eccentric nuts for several of these assemblies, including the um, x-axis gantry and the bed. That's not difficult, of course. As you will know, you have eccentric nuts. You put a wrench on the eccentric nut and you adjust the tightness until the wobble goes away so that there's no play. Do not over tighten. I suggested that they add instructions for that to the instruction manual since that was not present. I also suggested that they upgrade from the plastic feeder unit to either the Bontech dual drive feeder unit or the standard um, feeder unit that is it made of metal same red but the, it's this design but made of metal they're about 10 bucks on amazon i prefer this but i suggested that they upgrade from the plastic to the metal feeder unit i think the printer is worthy of that kind of an upgrade again not a problem with the printer just my suggestion to the manufacturer i also they suggested they include instructions in the instruction manual for tensioning the belts this one was a little loose this one was fine y-axis was fine didn't need any tensioning at all but my x-axis was a little loose this is not hard these are hammer nuts you loosen both of these i'm sorry these are hammer nuts you loosen both of them you take push this out with a wrench or pliers or just stick anything in here just put a screwdriver in there to push that out a little bit and then tighten one of them up and you're good after you get one tightened up make sure this is straight so your belt's not dragging and then tighten up the second one here you can see the kind of motion you get because of this misalignment of this wheel. This is the kind of motion that's permitted because there's nothing to, there's a gap between this wheel and the frame, so this motion's allowed. Most of the time that's not a problem. I did this entire print with um, 1.5 millimeter Z-hop throughout and I maintained consistency, so I'm not too worried about it, but that is something they're going to want to fix. Figure out whether it's these two bolt holes or these two bolt holes that's keeping this uh, unit from aligning itself correctly. So while we're here, let me show you some of the prints. You already saw the Marvin that I did. I also did a Benchy. The cat got a hold of it and he broke the pipe. He tried to chew it. <laughs> this is not an optimized Benchy. I just grabbed this Benchy right off of my... Um, my Google Drive, so this has not been optimized at all for this printer, and as you can see, it's quite nice. Uh, this does not include my new wipe um, zit removal method, where I add 8 millimeters of wipe, so you can see the zits. And the extrusion multiplier is probably not optimized for this printer yet. Remember, this is not optimized for this printer, I just printed this blind. And I am quite happy with that output. These prints came out fantastic. I do not see any bearing noise. I do not see any salmon skin. I wouldn't expect to from TMC 22A drivers. And I see no extrusion inconsistencies. I see no vibrations, nothing of issue. And also at about this point here, I crank the feed rate up to 170%. And as you can see, it still looks quite excellent. And this is watertight. I also printed a retraction nightmare. And you can see, especially, look at the walls on this print, how absolutely smooth they are. So very, very consistent layers, very good layer alignment, very good extrusion consistency. Again, all of these were done on the stock plastic feeder unit it came with, not the Bontec. This was done with the Bontec. All of these other prints were done with the stock feeder, with no modifications to the printer whatsoever. Inside and outside, the layer alignment is so good that you can see a sheen on the plastic. That sheen comes from consistent extrusion and aligned layers. All plastics will give you that sheen if you have a high enough quality print. The inconsistent extrusions and inconsistent layer lines causes a diffraction, kind of like um, you know, shining a light through a mist, because each photon that hits each layer will bounce back a different way, and so it's going to have that more matte-like finish, and you're not going to get that nice shine that you get from when you have a very good proper layer alignment. Then I also did the double helix phase, which I'm really a fan of. This is going to become a standard print of mine. 
I really like this. This is also a cooling, um, bit of a cooling torture test because of all the changes in direction in vase mode. So this is what I would call a complex vase mode print. The, these are never airtight, ever. They can't be because of the way they're printing. But no issues there. Then I also printed this. This is a multicolor print where I just change the filament between four different G-code files and I print all the colors on the same layers. So the yellow is almost 10 millimeters thick. I had my extrusion multiplier too low. So I gotta bump it up to 0.94 instead of 0.92 and that'll correct that. I, it's what you do. You keep bumping the extrusion multiplier lower and lower and lower until you get these little gaps. And then you go back a little bit because you went too far. Um, this is matte black from filament one. This is all from Filament 1. This is their Traffic Yellow, Traffic Red, Traffic White, and their new Matte Black. Really nice. But I am very pleased with how this came out. Each of these colors is two layers thick. 2.2 millimeter layers thick, printed right on top of the yellow base that was already printed. Very happy with that. I have no complaints. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna make this a little cleaner by a little trick I learned with my Maker Coins. Print it upside down, and that'll keep you from getting this little bit of um, sloppiness that you can sometimes get in between layers. Print it upside down so all your colors are touching the bed, and it'll be a lot smoother. You won't get so much shininess, but it'll get very smooth. I also like the fact that it uses the fiber plate, which I am a fan of. So it is a fake tack type surface on that fiberglass G10 plate. I would like to see them make an option available for their customers to buy a flex plate. So high temperature, 120C or higher magnetic base with a steel plate with this surface on top of the steel plate or give the customer an option, get this surface or get PEI. I prefer this because I can turn off the heat bed. Some people don't mind the heat bed being on and they want the shininess of the PEI surface and the auto release of the PEI surface. So that would be a nice upgrade that you could make available on your site. So when customers buy your printer, they can also choose, oh, I would like to buy the flex plate option and add that to the purchase. Otherwise, I am very, very pleased with this printer. As you can see, I've already added an upgrade to it. I think this printer is good enough that it's worthy of that upgrade, so it got it. Assembly was stupidly easy. Literally, these two assemblies are already attached by the cabling. All you have to do is put two bolts here, two bolts here, and two bolts here to attach your spool holder. Thread the spool holder into the top, and you're done. Adjust your eccentrics, adjust your bed level, and you are finished. It is that easy to assemble this printer. Very, very easy. The fans are not too bad. This one is actually surprisingly quiet. This one's slightly noisy, not bad. The only real noise is in one of the best components in the printer. The power supply has a noisy fan, and that's actually common to the power supply they used. I've had to replace the fan on every single one of these power supplies, but they're also my favorite power supply. A true Meanwell LRS 350 24 volt power supply. Excellent. Good job on using a high quality power supply. And that's a 60 by 10 millimeter fan. You can get them on Amazon. It's on my Amazon page. If you can get a quieter version of the fan for the Meanwell power supply, it is a 12 volt fan. 24 volt power supply, but 12 volt fan. If you have any questions, if you'd like me to point out anything else, um, you can see the board. It's just a Robin Nano 1.1. You can see it on my live stream. I don't want to pull the bottom of the printer off again. Otherwise, I am very, very pleased with the printer, and I would give this my blessing if you decide you want to buy one of these. I, I like it enough that I would say it's a safe to buy, and the print quality speaks for itself. I'll leave you with that once again. Oh, by the way, this is Prusament Mystic Green, and these are all filament one colors. Traffic red, white, and yellow, and matte black and Prusament Mystic Green, also available on Amazon now. This is a standard print of mine. They're actually useful. I'm gonna print these from now on. I just, I like these little baskets. I got a whole bunch of them. <laughs> so, that's it. If you have any questions, oops, my hair is a mess. If you have any questions, feel free to type below and add your questions, and I will do my best to answer them. Um, once again, Lotmax sent me this printer free of charge in exchange for making videos. This is my analysis video with updates that I would make to the printer, suggestions on how to fix small issues. 
Um, the only issue that I am not sure of has been fixed yet is the alignment of those triwheels for the vertical um, vertical rail trolleys for the x-axis otherwise the issue with the y-stepper motor apparently has been fixed they knew about that and corrected it mine was an earlier unit that didn't have the correction and otherwise I am pleased they also appear receptive to feedback and to making corrections to the printer I've already spoken with one of their engineers who gave me who told me about some of the fixes that they've already made so that is also a very good sign. It looks like they are interested in improving the product and making it better. And they started off with a very good one to begin with. So uh, good luck to them. And if you guys have any questions, ask below.